everyone, Steve here. Good morning. Welcome to this edition of Monday Morning Musing. We are continuing on on things about the Eucharist and cultural background issues thereof. Going to wrap up a few loose ends, and then in the next episode, we're going to move on to to a new a new topic. Uh, I've been trying to make the point that meals were the uh, significant point of identity and community contact, and that they had spiritual, spiritual, ethical, relational components to it. And in First Corinthians again, Paul talks about the the gathering of the saints, the meals. And he actually uses uh, cultural depnon and symposium type language. He calls it the, the, the depnon. But negatively, he talks about two things. The table of demons or devils, he says. The ta- when He talks about the partaking of the table of demons. And he talks about the cup of demons. Food and drink. Again, in a modern church, we're not going to be arguing about that. Now, there are two overtones with that. He's saying, look, if you are followers of the Christ... You can't be do, go, doing and going to those pagan meals and making offerings to Dionysus and Caesar and all that. You can't be making a drink libation offering to Dionysus and coming to the Lord's table thinking it's the same thing. You can't do that. But that makes that 1 Corinthians 10 rebuke all the more powerful, the rebuke we talked about the last time. Because he's saying, when you do come together, it's worse than that. How could it be worse than tables of demons, meals of demons, drinks of demons? We don't even have that conversation. I'm not even saying we should. It's probably culturally limited to the issues of their day. But Paul is saying, you guys are behaving worse than they are, than they do. When they get drunk and misbehave and worship, you know, whatever they're worshiping. Jude. You can argue about how, whether or not you think that should be in the canon, you know, uh, Luther puts it in the back of the Bible, along with Second Peter in the book of Revelation. He doesn't put it in the same, same level as the rest of the scripture. We can argue about that. But, but Jude says there are people who are blemishes on what? Your pulpit ministry? What you're teaching? Blemishes? On the agape meal. Stuff going on around the agape meal. That should not be happening. The admonition. I believe it's in 3rd John talking about... uh, you know, false itinerant ministries. And he talks about, don't invite them in. Don't even have a meal with them. Don't eat with them. Do you you see how culturally huge this meal issue is? What would happen if you invite them in? What did I say in earlier lessons? Remember, covenantal implications. That's why we can't go one-to-one. Oh, if somebody disagrees with me about the Bible, I can't even meet with them. I can't even talk to them. No. We don't live in that same world. Now, should we live covenantally 
in the bond that we would should have with the other members of the body of Christ? No, but do we not invite strangers and the sinner and the outcast in? Of course we invite them in. If a Jehovah's Witness wants to talk to me and let me talk to them, invite them in. So that's why you, that's how cults get started. When you don't put scripture in its appropriate context. But I am trying to emphasize to you how big a deal meals and fellowship and table fellowship and eating together was for them. And it just isn't for us. And if we either don't get it, or if we transfer just straight across, like proof texting a, a, a quote from uh, Third John, or, or, or proof texting Jude, here's what happens. The Bible becomes a weapon, a weapon of separation. Well, so-and-so and so-and-so, -so, you know, has a different uh, philosophy on uh, the doctrine of hell than I do. They're a blemish on, on, in our meetings, and we can't even have, have them in. We can't have them over. We can't talk to them. You know, there are churches that do shunning and blackballing and all that sort of thing based on these kind of verses. And I'm going to do an entire series on Matthew 18 because it's cropping up again as I speak over a certain issue with a certain uh, well-known uh, preacher who I don't care for very much and a big bunch of drama at a men's conference and everybody's saying Matthew 18, Matthew 18, Matthew 18. Matthew 18 has nothing to do with having a private conversation before you talk to somebody. It's another message, but my point is that's all Matthew 18 is about relational dynamic. All these uh, admonitions are about relational dynamics. The Hebrews admonition forsake not the assembling together of the saints. That's got nothing to do with a church meeting and whether you meet in a, in a, in a home or not. Here's what was happening. That's roughly 66 or 67 AD. Jerusalem is surrounded. The, uh, the, the brand of Judaism and the Christian Jews of the time were expecting deliverance. You know, God's going to, Jesus, is, he didn't do it while he was in his body, but he's coming back soon. And can, when he's coming back, he's going to take care of these Romans. It wasn't happening. And so they were getting depressed. Their eschatology was failing them. And they were thinking about going back to Judaism, reverting back to Judaism. That's why there's nothing to go back to. That's about uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 10. But the, but the gathering together was still about a meal because there's things that we're going to get I've done in a previous episode that I'm going to put into this series as a repeat. But there were things that were done at the meal, at the Lord's meal, that were anti-imperial. The Eucharist itself, the practice of the Eucharist, had anti-imperial secret messages. And now Jerusalem is surrounded by who? Roman armies sent by who? And you're going to continue to gather at a meal where things that are considered anti-imperial are going on, that passage in Hebrews is not to be used as a bludgeon to get people to attend meetings. Oh, for the love of God, I wish we would be free of that. He's talking about the meal slash Eucharist. Don't chicken out now. Don't quit. Don't quit honoring the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. We're going to get to that in, in, in another, another episode, a little more depth. Oh, yeah, it's great to say that you, you know, you're devoted to, to, to Jesus as Lord instead of Caesar until Caesar's armies are surrounding where you live and they are going to wipe you out. So that passage in Hebrews has got to be interpreted in the cultural, political, and spiritual 
climate of its day, and it has nothing to do with attending a church meeting to listen to a sermon. All right, I've gone a little long on this one. I will see you the next time.